Hey everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about what it's like to be a computer game designer. I originally was going to say what it was like to also be a programmer and an artist, even though the art one I pretty much watched, seeing what they go through. So I may do two more videos later on about programmers and and artists, but I've got an awful lot, it turned out, in the design folder. So I thought I'd just limit it to, if you're thinking about being a game designer, or you're already in the industry as a game designer, here are some things that are going to happen. Um, probably the biggest thing that will annoy you is that everybody, everybody thinks that they're a designer. And most of them, if not all of them, think they're a good designer, even though they have absolutely no idea what that process is like. And what I mean by that is everyone on the team and everybody outside the team will constantly be thinking of ideas of what should go in the game. And they think that by having an idea, they're a designer. And that is so superficial of an opinion of what a designer does that I thought I'd walk you through it. I've heard people refer to these as seagull designers because they come in, poop something and fly off thinking my job is done. I've also heard seagull about seagull producers. That could be a whole video of seagull people. But let me talk about what tends to happen is someone will have an idea. Hey, your, your game should do this. That's pretty much where it ends. Sometimes you can ask them, hey, what exactly do you mean? If it does this, does, won't this happen? How will you fix that? Uh, do, so if it does this, what about these other things? How does it interact with those things? I don't know. I just had an idea. Run with it. Happens all the time, by the way. So let me tell you what the real process of design is. Someone will have an idea, hopefully not one of those seagull designers, and then it gets converted to a specification. This is where 90% of those wannabe designers fail. They don't know how to do this. They don't even know what it is. They really underestimate how hard it is. And if they do write one, it's usually way underspecified. But a specification for a design feature is fairly specifically scoped for that feature. So it's not combat. It might be melee combat. It might be two-handed melee combat and its interaction with skills and um, other abilities in the game and perks and items. Here's specific items that are used by this two-handed weapon skill, melee skill. It's already, it's already like, ooh, these are big. It usually starts, as I've mentioned, with goals. What are you trying to do with this? What is your intent? This is important so that later on you can talk about whether or not what you've written meets that intent or if anyone wants to change it, does it still meet the intent? Or you can talk about, I think your intent is wrong. I think we should be trying to do this, which is a completely different kind of conversation. Then the specification itself goes into great detail on that feature. How is it used in the game? How does it interact with other features in the game? What kind of implementation you need? This is where eventually this designer or another designer will come in with a formula or numbers because eventually a programmer has to step in, read this document, understand what you're trying to do from the goal section, read the rest of it and see what he's supposed to do or she, and then implement it. And if you don't have formulas, if you don't have numbers, if you don't have links to all the other thing, features that this feature interacts with, that programmer is going to be unhappy and he's going to be in your office all, all the time. Similarly, an artist, usually the lead artist, and then they assign it, looks at these and goes, oh, this feature is going to need this kind of user interface or this kind of art for an item or an armor or an animation or a, a prop. So all these people get involved in that specification stage. It can take a while to do this. And usually one of those seagull designers, they're long gone. Then a programmer will actually get assigned this and try to implement it. 
they will come by the whoever wrote the specification. They will be in your office a lot. We'll go back and forth. Things may have to be changed. When they go to implement it, they may, they may discover that there are things in the implementation that don't fit with things that are already done. So then you have to decide, is this worth changing those existing things? That might get a producer involved. We don't have time to make these changes. Or maybe those other things are already causing problems. So he's like, oh, I'm so glad. Let's remove that. That is causing issues. Or let's change it. Then it gets implemented. Usually when the programmer is implementing it, they discover art that will be needed for implementation. Sometimes that art is made right then. Sometimes if the artists are busy, it's made later. So the feature is brought as close to finish as it can, gets blocked on art. An artist will eventually go in and make the art needed for it. It gets unblocked, usually goes back to the programmer who finishes it up. Then it goes to QA. I mean, we're not nearly done with the thing. It goes into QA where QA, as is their job, will bang on it as hard as they can and try to break that feature. Let me tell you, they are very successful at doing that. And also, I've watched other producers get mad at QA for finding these problems. And it could be a bug in the implementation, or it could just be a problem with the design itself. And I've seen, I witnessed producers yell at QA people for finding these things. It blew my mind. And I caught a few of them out on it. I'm like, why are you yelling at this person? You should be happy they found it before it shipped. So... When they found this bug, it goes back into that iterative implementation specification cycle because it may be they found a problem with the design itself, which means it needs to be respect. They may find a bug in the implementation, which means it needs to be recoded. Or this art doesn't loop, like maybe it's um or interrupt correctly. Maybe you're it's a, you know a reloading thing and it doesn't interrupt correctly, or it needs to loop a few times because this gun has a lot more ammo, so that it shows reloading and the original art doesn't doesn't loop. It could be a lot of things and it goes to different people, which is why, by the way, producers are so great because they monitor this whole process and keep people from going insane. So finally it's done and in the game. And the two things you now, as the designer, will encounter. One, if this original idea came from a seagull designer, they will take 100% credit for it, even though they were not involved in the 99% of the Herculean effort required to get this thing out. Also, and this is why I took a lot of notes, and I, still with my notes, there are disagreements. When that feature finally goes out, and people go, I love blah in this game. I love Feature X. Who's responsible for Feature X? Is it the person who had the high-level idea? Is it the person who wrote that very detailed specification that everybody read and worked off of? Is it the person who actually coded it? Is it the person who did the art for it? And maybe why people like it so much. Like, oh my God, that looks so cool. Is it QA who found all the problems done, all of them by the previous people and got it working right? So who's, whose feature is that? This is why frequently, and I could do a whole video on that. I could probably do a whole video about how I could do whole videos. But this is why sometimes I'll go, oh, that, that was... Bob's idea. That was Mary's idea. And sure enough, I'll get an email or a private DM and they'll go, you know, that actually was this person's. And we talk about it and we find out, sometimes we find out we're both wrong. It was actually somebody else's. Um, I'm definitely going to do it. I will do a whole video about how companions came out and fall out. And you can, you can fight over who should have credit for that. But anyway, that, that is a good example of what you will go through as a designer. And then let me give you some idea because the whole thing started with those seagull designers that come by and poop something on your desk and then they fly away. Let me go over some things that got pooped on my desk for reels. So years ago when MMOs were first getting started, MMOs really got came out in the late 90s. This was probably early 2000s. It could have been 99, but I think it was 2000. Sierra dropped something off at my desk. It was a specification of another company doing another game that looked like it was going to be an MMO. It was online multiplayer. They wanted it to have permanent depth. Let me describe what they thought was a cool feature. You'd log into their server, you'd make a character, and you'd go out in the world. You'd have fights, you'd talk to people, you'd quest, you'd craft, and all this. But if you ever died, you're dead. Boom, back to the character generator. 
own your character, his items and all that. They're just, when something dies, whoever kills them can loot them. So it's gone. They thought this was a good idea. Now, to put this in context, lots of games do this idea of permanent death. Usually they're single player. You're playing at home. And the way they work is, you know, you, you say, I want to play this mode. Temple had this, but it's by far not the only one. We called it Iron Man mode. You'd say, I want to play Iron Man mode. We go, okay. When you save, it takes you back to the main menu. You don't get to keep playing. When you load an Iron Man, <clears throat> excuse me, when you load an Iron Man save game, it deletes it after it's loaded. So there is no save games to go back to. This is an interesting way to play because it's the rate original D&D tabletop was played. You played and if you died and no one could raise you, you, you were done. It's an interesting way to play a single player game. I don't think that's a good way to play an MMO for a lot of reasons. The main one, which is you can sometimes die and it was completely not your fault. In a single player game, if you die, ultimately you probably did something you shouldn't have. But in an MMO, you might die for all kinds of reasons. You might die because... Somebody in your party didn't taunt the creature off of you because that their job is a tank or your healer didn't heal you and that was their job's healing. Or the group decided to go into a dungeon and you're like, this is way over our level and they convince you it's not. The problem with that is once it becomes in the player's mind, not their fault that they died, it's really hard to have that kind of mode. Plus in an MMO, <clears throat> especially with a lot of other ones out there that don't have this, that's a problem. So I wrote back and said, I think this is an issue, along with a bunch of other things I saw as an issue, like some races were restricted to people who had proven themselves fans of the game. So you had to put in like 100 hours or get a character up to max level cap before you were allowed to play other races. Nowadays, this is called unlock, but the way they, they um, presented it was as, unless you prove that you're a fan of this game, yeah, you don't get to be this race. Another uh, design idea that got pooped on my desk one day was, hey, we're trying to get rid of, we're trying to sand off the rough edges of the game. We should get rid of encumbrance. Nobody likes encumbrance. I should be able to pick up anything I want and not be forced to move slowly or not fast travel. I just want to be able to pick up everything I want. And I was like, okay, but another problem we're already having with this game is your inventory gets too big. And it's hard to manage your inventory when there's hundreds of items in it. Won't this make it work worse? Won't that make that a lot worse? Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. But, you know, we've got to solve that anyway. So let's let's just roll it in with that. And I'm like, yeah, but encumbrance kind of solves that by saying we know the maximum of what you're going to carry except ammo, which we made weightless. But it there's only so many ammos and they stack. Which led to a whole other conversation about how that same person wanted us to get rid of ammo. In other words, ranged weapons, every ranged weapon had an infinite firing capacity. Now, while I thought infinite ammo on a particular weapon drop would be an interesting, you know, advantage. Here's a weapon, it may not be that great, but it's got infinite ammo. But once everything has infinite ammo, you now have to balance them in a different way. Plus, that was kind of the advantage of melee weapons. They never run out of ammo. Now, ranged weapons never run out of ammo because they both can be used infinitely. Melee weapons don't even become the ranged character's fallback. Oh, I'm completely out of ammo. At least I can stab them with this knife. I asked this person how they would change the existing specifications of those other features, and they basically said, well, that's your job. And I'm like, no. My job is to get my stuff in the game. If you want this in the game, you're gonna to explain to me that other stuff. They didn't, that stuff wasn't put in the game. And then the last story is I actually worked with a designer who thought and told me that a designer's job is to kill the player. And he meant it. He thought his goal as a designer, and he bases off his goal as a DM, was this notion that you tried to kill the player. I asked him, I'm like, do you really mean challenge? You know, with really good combat and 
dialogues that can lead to being attacked and stealth where you get caught. And he said, no, you're trying to kill the player. You, that's your goal. That's every everything you write, every feature. The, the main goal is how could this end up killing the player? That was an interesting discussion because I don't agree with it. I could see how you could make a game that way. That wasn't my goal. And he got really upset. And he said, well, if that's not the goal, what is your goal? And I was like, to entertain the player? My goal in every game is that the person playing should have fun. I know that's nebulous, but that's why you write goals at the top. Because they are supporting, ultimately, a top-level goal. In which case, it was for me to have fun. This is why sometimes my games aren't balanced. I'm not as focused on balance as I am on fun. If people can find a way to make it really easy to kill some monster or to make a build that's more powerful than another build, I'm usually okay with that. The only thing I don't like is if you can make a build that can't finish. I don't like that. But I'd also say that easily falls under the rule of that's not fun. If you make a build and 70% of the way through a game, you find out I can't complete the game with this character I made. That's not fun. That is the definition of not fun. So... I tried to convince him that killing the player was not his number one priority, but I did tell him I, I look forward to playing a game that you eventually direct where that is your number one goal. So I hope I didn't discourage anyone from ever wanting to be a designer, but that is what you're up against as a designer. And I think the other roles don't have that notion that many people have that I could do your job. I don't see people going up to programmers going, yeah, I could code that better than you. I certainly don't see people going to artists and saying, I could easily make a creature that animates better than that, or I could model something better than that. Here, move aside. Let me do it. Never happened. I've never seen that happen. I've seen that happen in design many, many, many times. So if you want to be a designer, be aware. Don't let that discourage you. Just go in knowing that that's going to happen.